Krista Urban. I am a trainer with training services uh, here at University Park. Today with us, we have Marco Enocente. He is the customer service manager from Zoom, uh, who's our vendor. He's gonna give us uh, some information about the key features and tools in Zoom meeting today as they relate to faculty, along with some use cases and support resources for using Zoom. Uh, we are going to be recording today's session and it will be posted on conferencing.psu.edu after it gets closed caption. So Marco, if you could give me permission to record. Um, oh, and it looks like you've done that. So I will go ahead and record today's session and I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Marco. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Lisa, and hello, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Marco. I'm a customer success manager here at Zoom. And we're going to go through today kind of some Zoom basics. Uh, just some housekeeping items so everyone's aware before we get started. Uh, you all have been muted by default coming into this session, but you can unmute yourself at any time if you have any questions that you want to ask. Um, to do that, you kind of just move your mouse into the bottom left corner and you'll see a little microphone there that you can click and unclick at any time. Um, we do want this to be interactive, so if you have questions, um, you can certainly hold them to the end if you prefer, but feel free to interrupt me at any time to ask a question. You can do that, um, again, by unmuting yourself and asking a question or even typing it into the chat if you prefer. So with that, we're going to get started. So a few things that we like to say here at Zoom is that we are available on any device anywhere. What that really means is you can actually host or attend Zoom meetings from your laptop or desktop computers. You can host and attend Zoom meetings from your mobile devices. You can host and attend meetings from different Zoom room options, uh, conference room options, one called Zoom rooms, which is proprietary, and then the uh, SIP rooms you maybe have set up. And of course, you can join over the telephone. So a few use cases and things that we're gonna try and cover today, just the way that Zoom is being used in education, um, you know, different ways that it's enhancing the faculty experience around being, bringing, being able to bring in guest lectures without having to fly them in. Uh, you can just bring in a guest lecture at any time you want to. Um, you also have the ability to share live events, some online lecturing, interviews. Um, the tools for this are breakout rooms, guest access, recording. So we'll call these out as we go along. And again, we'll share this to make it available to you. Um, here's the agenda for today. Logging in um, is what we're going to cover first, getting into the web portal, scheduling um, within Zoom. So we're going to show you a few different ways that you can schedule in the Zoom interface. Um, we're also going to show you how to use the desktop client. So one thing to call out that when you want to host Zoom meetings, you do have to install a desktop client for that. Um, and the difference between the host and participating is that uh, like the host running the meeting, you need the client, but someone just joining your meeting does not need to install that client. And we'll take a look at that later, but it, and it's, and again, I'll call that out later. It is definitely something we want to make sure you're aware of. Um, we'll also take a look at the host controls. So the controls that are actually going to be available to you when you're hosting a meeting. We'll take a quick look at the mobile app and then we'll close it out with just the Zoom, how to get support around Zoom if you need it. Okay, so let's talk about logging in. We do have a specific page created just for Penn State. It is psu.zoom.us. So this is where you can go to if you haven't logged in before or if you need to continue to log in to get to the web portal. But this is where you can go to kind of get your account set up if need be. And when you come here, you have the option to actually join a meeting right from here if you wanted to. You could even host meetings directly from here. But the big piece is signing in. All right, so when you do click the sign in link, it's going to bring you to your internal web access where you're going to use your already existing user ID and password that you have already set for Penn State. Um, so you don't have to create a new username and password just to use Zoom. It's going to be the same user ID and password that you're already familiar with. When you do get logged in, it's going to look something like this, right? So you're going to have probably this blank avatar if you haven't updated a picture yet. Um, we do recommend that you upload a picture here. That picture will actually persist over several different Zoom applications, not just stuck in the web portal. Um, for example, if I stop my video really quickly, 
um, you should now see the my picture um, that I have on my portal um, shown there. So anytime that you're moving through, that picture will I'll call out where that picture is going to be um, showing up. A few other things to look at here. Um, you know, I'm going to skip to the bottom real quick and then come up to the the two main points. But um, your internal capacity. So this is what you have available to yourself as a Zoom user. Um, all Penn State users have the ability to host meetings with up to 200 attendees, meaning you can have 200 other people join any meeting that you've got. You also have webinar assigned to you where you can have up to 500 participants come in. So webinar and meeting are slightly different products. Um, meeting is the one we're using today. It's the full collaboration product where everyone can share their camera and speak. Webinar is much more of a project out. Um, your participants come in, they have no video and they have no audio. Um, but again, with meeting itself, you can hold sessions with up to 200 people. Now looking up here, um, Zoom does give you actually a personal meeting room that is always available just to you. It's also an ID that Zoom will set automatically, but you have the ability to configure and change this number to be something that makes sense to you. This is often updated as your phone number, for example, maybe at the university. So a number easy for you to remember, um, that you could quickly give people to say, hey, join my personal meeting, here's the ID, and they could join that way. Along with that, you actually get a personal link. So you can create a personal vanity URL here where it would be psu.zoom, and you could put in your first last name, um, full first name, full last name, whatever kind of link you want to create. It's tied to the same number string here, but it's just in a little different format. And for example, I have that stored in my email signature block. So it's, you know, Zoom with me and it has my link and people can click on it. So it's a nice way, again, to personalize this room. Now to call it out when we start talking about scheduling, when you are scheduling, you typically schedule a unique ID every time. But again, Zoom gives you your own room that is dedicated just to you where that ID will never change and won't be confused with anyone else's ID either. So off to the left here, you can see we're on the profile tab of this page and we're gonna just go through meeting settings, meetings and a few other items here just to kind of call out the different options that are available to you when you log into the web portal. First thing we're gonna do is take a look at some meeting settings. Now this slide is actually a really long page just kind of condensed to show as many as we can. Um, I'm not gonna drill into all of these, but I do wanna call out some specific ones that are nice to use. So this is, as it says, in meeting, basic. So these are features that are available to you when you are hosting a meeting. Do you want chat to be available in the meetings that you're hosting? Do you want private chat to be available in the meetings that you're hosting? Um, maybe you want chat, but you don't want individuals that, to be able to privately chat between themselves. If you're doing large lectures, perhaps, um, and don't want the students sending private chats to themselves over Zoom that you have no visibility into, the kind of thing you maybe want to uncheck. If you want to make sure that you can use the annotation tools, so I'm using one of them right now, this is the spotlight, we'll look at these in more detail later, but if you want to make sure it's available, you just have to make sure the box is checked, and it usually will be by default. Um, polling's another one, you have the ability to run polls in meetings, so if you try to go run a poll in a meeting and you don't see the icon there that you need, that means you haven't gone into the meeting section and made it available. Other few key callouts are breakout rooms, making sure breakout rooms are available, um, especially in the kind of education space we're seeing a lot of use here. Breakout rooms, just like they sound, um, you take a subset of your participants in a meeting and you split them out into separate rooms to have their own side conversations. And we'll take a look at the process for setting those up later. Uh, if you want to use closed captioning that's available, then there's also attention tracking. Um, so this, this is a nice one because it'll actually show you who's paying attention to the meetings that you're hosting, um, whether Zoom is the focus screen or if they've kind of gone off and looked at something else. And you can tell who's paying attention and who's not. We also have something called waiting room, which is really nice. Um, it will bring people into a kind of waiting room space first prior to letting them into any meeting that you're hosting. To call it out with recording, you'll just have uh, local recording available to you now. Um, so you can record your meetings locally. And then one up here that I really like myself is this email notification section. This when attendees join meeting before host. Wh what that means is Anytime I've got a scheduled meeting and maybe someone jumps in a few minutes early, I'll actually get an email letting me know, hey, 
Lisa has joined your meeting um, and is you know live in there and waiting. And if I'm available, if I'm not tied up in something else, I'll go ahead and jump into that meeting so at least Lisa and I can kick it off. Maybe we're still waiting for other people, but it would give her a good experience from not having to kind of wait on her own until everybody gets there. Another call out on this page is this scheduling privilege. So this is used kind of in the admin um, example of, you know, an administrator that perhaps has access to your calendar as well. You know, maybe they book things for you on your calendar. You could actually have them book Zoom meetings for you also. So for example, if, you know, I was uh, Lisa's administrative assistant and I owned her calendar where I booked all of her normal meetings, she could in here give me scheduling privilege and I would be able to still schedule as I normally do, but then also schedule a Zoom meeting for her, which would be her license as opposed to mine. So I wouldn't have to be there as the admin assistant to kick it off and transfer it over. Lisa could just show up at the right time, click the link and get moving and everything would be associated with her account. Moving down to the next tab now, onto the meetings themselves. So when you first come here, the view that you're gonna see is upcoming meetings. So this is gonna show you all the scheduled and recurring meetings that you have set where you are the host of Zoom. So not, not meetings you've been inviting to, it's not a calendaring thing per se, but it does show you all the meetings you scheduled where you are the host of a Zoom meeting. So you can see I have a lot of recurring meetings here, but I could page over and then I would get to anything that's a calendar, like a, a daily invite as well. On this page, you see the topic of those meetings, what the meeting ID is for each of those meetings. And if I wanted to, I could actually start any one of those meetings directly from the web portal. I'm gonna move over to the, uh, the third tab here, this personal meeting room. So this is again, that personal meeting ID. Um, this, was, this is from mine, where you can see that 805-738-5283, and that's my desk line here in Santa Barbara. Um, and you can see what my vanity URL looked like, which we talked about earlier, where it's got my name in it. And then you can configure some settings here. Um, by default, do you want your host video to be on or off anytime you join? And you can change that, of course. Um, participants as well, do you want anytime someone joins your personal meeting ID for their camera to be on? Um, or maybe you want to make them feel a little more comfortable by default anytime they join their camera is off But they could always turn it on when you ask them to it a, a little bit later You could require a password to this you could Do something that's called enable join before host which means they could actually get into that meeting and be there before you join The difference here is if you don't have this checked someone coming into the meeting just will be presented with a little box that says please wait for the host to arrive my recommendation for your personal meeting ID um, on this page here is to not have enable join before host checked. We'll talk about it again when we're doing scheduled meetings in just a second, but I highly recommend for your personal meeting ID, you don't have this option checked. Um, that way you don't have to worry about people joining again what is your personal room without you being aware. Okay, we're gonna move down now to the reports tab. There's a big kind of jump in the screen size there, sorry. So you can also run reports on the meetings that you've hosted, right? So when you are hosting meetings and you have obviously participants coming in, you have the ability to see, hey, who showed up to the meetings I hosted? So you go to the reports tab, you drill into what would be usage. What you're gonna wanna do then is set your time frame and be aware. Um, so the maximum that this report can show is for one month the maximum time back that it can go is six months. So six months worth of data, one month at a time. Um, you will see the default view that looks like this when you bring it up and it'll show you all the topics that were held during that time frame, what that meeting ID was, when that meeting um, started, or when it was created, when it started, when it ended. So you'll get to know the duration of that, any particular meeting. And then you can actually click on these participant lists here to see who attended. You would click on one of these, it would give you a participant list for who came into that meeting, and you can see how long each person stayed, and you can also see their attentiveness score, so how much were they actually paying attention to that meeting that you were just hosting that they were in. And of course, you can export this list into Excel so you can have it for yourself at a later date. Okay. So we're actually gonna talk about scheduling Zoom itself. And there's a few different ways you can schedule Zoom. We're gonna today just talk about scheduling in the web portal where we just were, 
and then also scheduling through the Zoom application itself. So again, back in that web portal, if we were on that meetings tab where we saw all of our upcoming meetings, there's a nice big blue button that says schedule a new meeting. When you click that, it brings you to a page here that where you can start configuring this meeting that you're scheduling. What's your topic going to be? What, when is it going to happen? And what's the duration? And now with Zoom, you don't have to worry about that duration. If you set it for an hour, the meeting is going to go an hour and 15, two hours, three hours, four. You don't have to worry about that. Um, it's not going to shut it down for you as long as you are in there and live and hosting that meeting. Choose your time zone. Is this a recurring meeting? Something that you're going to want to use this ID over and over for? Great, you can set that. Again, with the video options, do you want your camera to be on by default as well as your participants as soon as they join the meeting? You can choose your audio options. Um, do you want it to be just VoIP only or just telephone? We highly recommend making it both, allow people to come in how they want to. And then a few more meeting options. Again, you could require a password for this specific meeting. You could enable join before host for this meeting that we're scheduling. Um, enable join before host again to talk about it. It's really great for those kind of team meetings, group meetings where it's just a few folks um, and you know maybe it's a recurring meeting that people can come in and they can see each other where a view of the host may be running a few minutes late sometimes. If you're, doing lar if you're scheduling larger lectures or larger training sessions and things like that, I don't recommend, it, recommend having this checked um, because it might be hard. You, know, you kind of want those sessions to everyone to come in when you're ready for them to come in. This is let people come in, let the meeting kick off, even if you're not there. You could schedule a meeting using your personal meeting ID. Um, Lots of people do this and they, they use it well. My one kind of call out here to be aware of is if you are scheduling two meetings using your personal meeting ID, they happen to be back to back, that's the same URL now that's gonna be used for potentially two different topics. Inevitably, one meeting is gonna go long or someone's gonna join the next meeting early and someone's gonna hear content that they perhaps shouldn't. So just be mindful if you are gonna be scheduled using your personal meeting ID. We talked before on that scheduling on behalf, so am I scheduling this meeting for myself? Or if Lisa again had given me that scheduling privilege, I could choose her name in this dropdown and I'd be making a, a meeting for her. And then I can also set an alternative host. So this is really used in those cases where I might not show up to this meeting that I'm scheduling. Um, again, example could be a weekly uh, recurring team meeting that I've got with the people on my team. I could make one of the other people an alternative host or multiple the alternative host. And then if I get booked, double booked and have to go attend another meeting for whatever reason, whoever joins that meeting that I've set as alternative host will come in. They'll be the host of that meeting and have all the main control that they normally do. Um, and the meeting can continue completely without me being there. Once I have this all set the way I want, I've got my nice big schedule button here. I press schedule and it brings me to a review page, letting me see how I've set everything up. And if you had uh, either Outlook or Google, you could add it to the relevant calendar as well. Or you can copy this invitation and drop it into the other calendaring system that I believe you may be using. So this is one way to schedule meetings. The next thing I'm gonna show you is from the client app itself. So we're gonna take a deeper dive into the client also in just a minute. Um, but for the client itself, when you wanna schedule, using this desktop application, you've got a nice big button here that says schedule. And you see all the same things that we talked about before, setting your topic, your start time, duration, time zones, the video, how it's gonna behave, telephone, requiring a password. If you had any of these calendars, you could integrate with that, or you would just use other calendars. You would hit schedule. It's gonna bring you up the review page here where you can copy this to a clipboard and drop it into a calendar or invitation system that you want. It will then also post it into that upcoming meeting section in the web portal. Okay, so that's scheduling. What we're going to do now is transition to the client itself. Just talk about this a little bit. Um, the client is something you have to download. So you do actually have to install and download this client onto your computers that you're going to be running your Zoom meetings from. You can get that client from zoom.us forward slash download. There'll be a nice big download button right there for you to bring you to the most recent version. Once you have it installed, there's a few things that you're going to want to do to log in. Um, 
tendency is going to be to want to put in your email and password where it says log in all nice and big. Uh, we actually don't want you to do that right there. We want you to click this link that says log in with SSO. When you do that, it will present you with a new window asking you to enter in your company domain. So this is where you would put the PSU and it's got the .zoom.us. So if you remember, that's the same as the URL we looked at earlier where you log into the web page. You hit continue. Again, it presents you with the Penn State web access to put in your existing user ID and password and it's gonna connect your desktop application to be the same user as that you logged into the web portal. Once you get logged in, again, this is what the client looks like. This is gonna be running on your machine. Um, if you set a profile picture, it's gonna set up right, show right there for you. From your client, you can instantly start meetings with video or without video, and these will be associated with that personal meeting ID we talked about earlier. Again, always available to you anytime you want to start a meeting. You could join meetings directly from the client. If someone else gave you a meeting ID and said, hey, come into my meeting real quick, here's the ID. Just go to your client, type it in. You can share your screen really quickly with a one touch into existing meetings. We already talked about scheduling meetings. Um, and then there's also this settings section here. Uh, so we just got a question, what is the Zoom client app? So this is what we're talking about right now. So it is, the client app is something that you need to download in, e in order to be able to host a Zoom meeting. So your participants don't need this. Um, anyone coming into a Zoom meeting can just click the link you provide them with and they come right in. But if you are hosting Zoom meetings, you do need to have this client application downloaded. Again, you get that at zoom.us forward slash download. This is what, it, after you log in, what it's gonna look like on your machine. And then it's, these are all the controls that it gives you um, once you've installed it. So as a host, this is something you're gonna need to have running on your machine. We're gonna drill into the settings first and then we're gonna take a look at this bottom ribbon as well. So we're on the home page here. This is where we see the host, the gear icon here to get into settings. We're gonna click that and we're gonna talk about some few settings that are best practices that we recommend setting up and just some general ones to kind of review. If you happen to be using dual monitors, you can check that with Zoom. Go ahead and have that set. Um, underneath here, these two are normally checked by default. Enter full screen automatically when starting or joining a Zoom meeting and enter in full screen when someone starts sharing their screen. You know, personally, I have these two unchecked. I don't like when I join a Zoom meeting or share my screen in the Zoom meeting for it to take over my entire desktop and screen. It's a personal setting. I, I like to have it. If you uncheck that, Zoom just starts and lives in its own little window, um, just like any other application versus taking over your entire desktop. Um, personal preference, but I do a lot of trainings and I do a lot of things and I like to kind of make sure I know where my Zoom window is and maybe where my other applications I was working where are. Um, a few other call outs here, or perhaps the biggest call out here, if you are running Windows, so if any of you are on Windows machines, there's this top one here, start Zoom when I start Windows. Highly recommend you check this if you are running Windows machines. You don't have to do this with Macs. Um, Mac by default will always have the application started and running in the background for you. Um, with Windows, you do have to choose for it to behave that way. And then anytime you start your computer up on Windows, Zoom will, that Zoom application will be running and you'll already be logged in and everything will be fine for any time you're trying to host meetings. So strong recommendation, Windows, make sure you check this box. Next tab over is audio, um, and here, best practice, highly recommend, as soon as you install this client, go into the settings like we did, go to the audio tab, and test your audio settings to make sure you've got the right configuration that you're looking for, whether you're gonna want it to be your headset that you've got on your computer, or if you're gonna want it to go through your internal mic and speakers, whatever it may be, but you really wanna make sure you configure and test these before hosting any meetings, especially if before hosting any large meetings. Um, another call out here as a setting is this always mute microphone when joining a meeting. I have this one set for myself and what that means is anytime I join a meeting that anybody's hosting, no matter what, I come in muted. So if I'm fumbling with my headset or something else is going on, I don't have to worry about distracting them. I by default am going to come in muted to that meeting. Um, the next one is video. So much like audio, you can choose your camera source if you have multiple available. So if you've got an uh, external kind of USB camera or versus your internal one, you can switch between the two and you can set which one you want to be the default when you're normally doing Zoom meetings. 
And much like the audio, you do have the option to always turn off video when joining a Zoom meeting. So anytime you join a meeting, if you don't want your camera on by default, there is a setting where you can flag that for yourself right here. I'm going to skip over and move to the record tab here. So again, you have the ability to record your Zoom meetings locally. What that means is they will be stored on the desktop of the computer that you're running that session from. Uh, Zoom will create a default folder path for you um, in the documents folders, but you can change that file location. If you don't like them to be labeled Zoom and you want to put them somewhere else that you're, that you're comfortable with, you can change that file location. There's also an accessibility tab here where if you are going to be using closed captioning live in a meeting, um, what that means is you would have to have another participant or yourself actually typing into the closed captioning field, but you can control that font size if you need to in the live sessions. And then there's another checkbox here that I, this is again something that I use personally that I really like. Um, always display all the action buttons and I'll talk about what those are, but the action buttons are all those buttons like the microphone, the camera that kind of maintain along the bottom. You move your mouse there, they pop up. You move your mouse away, it goes down. I have that checked so those action buttons are just always up. It's a great way for me to see everything that I want to right in front of me without having to worry about it. Coming back to the client itself now, out of the settings section, again, we have multiple, uh, a few options here along the bottom ribbon. We were on the home page. Um, if we move to the meetings page here, what we actually have is similar to the web portal, right? When I look at my meetings on the desktop application, I actually see all of my upcoming and scheduled meetings here also. And I can start any one of these meetings directly from this client application. So I don't actually have to log into the web portal to see the meetings that I've got scheduled, to see the meetings that I've got that are recurring, where again, I am the host of. And I would be able to hover over any one of these and click start meeting when the time for that to start and I get into that meeting and everyone else joins as well. Also, there's the little recorded, there's the recorded tab is the second one here. So I can see all the meetings that I've recorded and I can open them right from here. I can view the recording. It takes me to the, the local file and I could delete it from here if I needed to as well. So again, from the desktop app, really powerful. You can start any one of those meetings that you've got scheduled for yourself. Okay, so we're going to transition now actually off the application itself and talk about hosting a meeting. So these are going to be the controls that you have available to you when you're hosting a session. When you first join a meeting, you'll, you know, this should be familiar. You're going to see a page that looks like this. You know, no content is being shared, no cameras are being shared yet. And what we're going to do is just take a look at the buttons across the bottom here left to right. And again, these are those action buttons I was referring to. So the first is, you know, managing your audio. You've got the little microphone there. You can click on that and mute and unmute yourself at any given time in the meeting. There's also this little up carrot here, which opens up a few options where maybe in the middle of the meeting, you have to change your audio source. Maybe my headset goes dead for whatever reason, runs out of batteries. I need to quickly switch to my, um, the built-in microphone, um, input and output. I can do that on the fly in the meeting itself. I can also leave the computer audio completely if I want to dial in instead of joining over VoIP, and I could jump into more audio options. Video is similar. I can mute and unmute my camera at any time just by clicking on the camera icon. And then I also have the little up carrot here where if I needed to, I could change my camera source in the meeting itself. I can also jump into more video settings if I wanted to. When camera is being shown in no content, so again, not displaying content like I am today, but uh, or right now, but maybe just everyone is sharing their cameras, we have two different views that are available. Uh, the first is called Active Speaker View. And this will be the default view when you join uh, meetings. And what that means is the person that is speaking is going to take up the largest amount of real estate on your screen. And as each person speaks, it kind of, Zoom will just automatically translate them down into the bottom section taking up that page. We also have something called gallery view. And what this does is it right sizes all the tiles of everyone that's in the meeting. And then whomever's speaking actually gets highlighted. Um, so gallery view is one of those great things, again, to use for kind of smaller sessions and team meetings where everyone's going to be very collaborative and, you know, maybe each person's going to have a chance to speak or whatever it were. Um, it's a really good way for everyone to work together and kind of give it that in live meeting feel. 
you toggle between the two views right here in the top right corner, where you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view. And again, this is when content is not being shared. Gallery view also can actually have up to 25 people on a single page. So again, you can hold meetings with up to 200 people. All 200 could be displaying their video. We'll show 25 on one page and then you could page over to each successive page to see 25 more, 25 more, 25 more within the gallery view. So everyone could be sharing their cameras and you can have everyone on there and just page through to see who each, who, who's online. Okay, so turning the cameras off for now in this view, we're moving over to the next icon, which is the little person with a plus sign, and that's invite. And not to be confused with what we saw earlier with scheduling and potentially inviting someone through um, whatever calendar tool or email tool you use. This is, I started a meeting. I am live, and I want to invite someone to this meeting right now. Um, so I'm live. I can copy that URL and send it off to someone either in a chat client or email. I can copy that full invitation and as well send that off. If you've got it plugged into Gmail, you could send it off or uh, sync it with your default email service. You can also invite a contact. Um, so anyone that's in your university that has downloaded their Zoom license will actually be a contact here. So you could just search for their name. You could search for, for example, uh, Lisa Urban. You could see that she's available and you could invite her directly to that meeting. She'll get a ping on her side saying, hey, Marco's inviting me to a meeting. Yes, I'm available, I'm gonna join it. You can invite people by phone, putting in their name and then dialing out to them. Um, and you can even invite a room system. So again, if you're using any of the H.323 SIP rooms for your services, um, you can put in the pairing code and just bring them right in. The next icon over we're gonna talk about is managing a participant. So this is a little two-person icon. And so this is once you have people in your meeting, what are the controls that you're gonna have over them? So you would click on the manage participants and what that's going to do is open up a window for you showing you everybody that's in that meeting. And what it's going to show is you at the top and then each of the attendees and you'll see who's muted uh, their audio and who's muted their camera, who's joined over VoIP will be the microphone and who's actually called in on the telephone. So you'll be able to see the difference there. A few options that you have is you can actually mute all your participants upon entry. Now what that means is as soon as they come into the meeting, they're muted. You can do this at the scheduling level now as well. So if you're scheduling a large meeting, um, I highly recommend doing mute participants upon entry. That way as soon as people come in, they are muted. And again, you don't have to worry if they're coming in late, five minutes late, 10 minutes late, and you're deep into whatever you're presenting and someone happened to come in with their, you know, if they weren't muted and they're fumbling with their audio and they could be very disruptive. This is a great way to reduce that risk. You could lock the meeting if you wanted to and you could even push someone out into a waiting room um, if you wanted to them just part for, for the time being not be in the meeting. You also can quickly mute and unmute everybody if you wanted to. So, you know, in conjunction with muting participants spawn entry, when you click this mute all, you immediately mute everyone that's already there and now you have the option to let participants mute or unmute themselves. So I use this a lot as well in trainings. Like I'll use the mute participants upon entry and I'll typically allow participants to unmute themselves. And I just set that stage in the beginning. I let people know, you know, thanks for coming. Just so everyone knows you are muted today. But if you have a question, please go ahead and unmute yourself. If I had done the opposite where I said, I don't want them to be able to unmute themselves, I would let them know that as well, you know, and I would say, please let me know if you have something you'd like to say, you can raise your hand or chat me, and I as the host can then unmute them, and they could never unmute themselves in that session. So for large um, sessions you may be holding, this is a great way to control the crowd a little bit and make sure you don't have any disruptions over the audio feed. When you're looking at any given individual, maybe you didn't do that mute all option, you can actually mute one by one. So if I'm getting some loud noise coming off of Charisma for whatever reason, like picking up something in her audio, I could mute her if I needed to. I could actually also unmute Charisma if I wanted to. So I could mute or unmute her audio feed. Under the more icon, I could also stop her video feed. So if Charisma got up and I was tired of looking at an empty chair, I could stop her video feed. Now the difference between the video and the audio here is with audio, again, I can mute somebody and I could unmute someone's audio. With video, I can never turn someone else's video on. Only the person on that end can start their camera. So just be, <coughs> excuse me, just be aware of that. 
I could quickly chat to somebody. I could make somebody else a host. So maybe I, you know, something's come up and I have to leave this meeting really fast. I can make Charisma a host, leave the meeting, and the meeting can continue without me. I can make somebody a co-host, which gives them some similar um, controls. They're able to manage, help me manage participants if I needed to, um, but there are a few things that they can't do, like recording and stuff like that. Um, Lisa just asked a great question. What's the difference between alternative host and co-host? So alternative host is something you set up ahead of time. You know, you know you may not be there. And you want them to potentially be the host of that meeting in case you don't show up. Co-host can't be configured ahead of time. It's in the meeting itself. I am the host and I know I'm here. I'm going to make somebody a co-host to help me moderate the participants a little bit. So think of it that way. Great question. Um, if I again needed to put somebody on hold or even if I needed to remove somebody from the meeting for whatever reason, I could do that as well right here. Um, the difference between a co-host and a host. So a host actually, I'd say the big one is that the host has the ability to record on their own. They can just record the session. They don't have to ask for permission. A co-host still cannot record a meeting. They have to ask the host for the ability to record. And a co-host cannot create breakout rooms. Um, a host has to create the breakout rooms, which we'll talk about in a minute. But a co-host can go into each breakout room and talk to the participants in each, but they couldn't configure it for the host. So those are the two key differences between a host and a co-host. Great questions. Um, a few more things here. OK, so that was it for managing participants. Again, um, you can mute them, kick people out if you need to, mute everybody, mute your participants upon entry. It gives you a lot of control within this window of managing the folks that are going to be in your meeting. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to skip over polling, and we're going to talk about sharing screen. So we already sh talked about how you can share your camera within Zoom, but of course, you can also share content or your screen. Um, when you click the little share screen icon, a window will pop up for you that asks you, well, what is it you're wanting to share? Are you wanting to share your whole desktop, either one or two, if you're running a multiple desktop environment? Do you want to share a whiteboard? Which is just like it sounds. It'll bring up a white screen, and then you and your other participants can actually all use the annotation tools to collaborate on that. Do you want to share your iPhone or iPad? You can literally pair your iPhone or iPad, as long as they're on the same wireless network, to that meeting, and it's going to be, you know, whatever you're scrolling through and apps you're opening, everyone's going to see. Do you want to share a specific camera feed? So instead of content, I want my participants to see this specific camera feed the whole time. Um, or you can also share specific applications. So you don't have to share your whole desktop. You could share just Excel if you wanted to, or just Word, PowerPoint, and choose which PowerPoint, or a web browser if you wanted to. So you have all those options to share. And again, actually as the host, of course, you can share your screen, but all of your participants actually have the ability to share their screen as well even if they are not a normal Zoom user. So just someone coming into your section or into your meeting does have the ability to share their screen if you want them to. Once you know what you want to share, you kind of click it once and it'll turn green and you can do the little share screen on the right or you could double click it and that would do just the same and take you right into sharing. Now one thing I want you to notice, we're going to pretend that we're going to share screens here. Um, all those action buttons that were along the bottom once you actually hit share screen, though that bar now moves up to the top of your screen. And just so you know, this also isn't locked. So it does move up to the top, but you could actually move that around with your mouse if you need to. But now you see your audio is there. Again, as a host, you need to unmute or mute yourself, your video. You can get into managing your participants, all the things that we saw before. But now what we have is this concept of new share. Right, So we were sharing our screen, and now we've got this concept of new share, which brings up that same window. Now, this is a subtle difference. Um, and new share is something, once you get really comfortable with Zoom, you'll start using more and more. And it's a really great feature, especially if you're going to be sharing something like PowerPoint, and then later in your session, you want to share Word. Um, you know, you can do the stop share, which is the normal tendency. So if you stop sharing, you know, everyone comes back to their cameras, and then you could share the new application. And, you know, it just gives a slightly disjointed experience where if you do new share, it's a seamless transition. Um, and just to kind of maybe demonstrate that a little bit, what I'm going to do is stop sharing really quickly. Say, like, I want to go now and share my, um, you know, share my desktop. 
Well, to do that, I'm going to do stop share, which now brings back the cameras. You know, all sharing is gone, and you can kind of look around. And then I would do new share or share screen again to share my uh, browser. So you can see how it dropped us out of one and then now brings us back to sharing. Well, this time I'm going to do that new share I talked about. And I'm going to now choose my PowerPoint again. So what happened in that case now is instead of dropping into the videos and now a new item, it's just a seamless transition between the two items that I was sharing. You can pause the sharing at any time as well if you want to. So if you want to kind of just pause on that screen and no one sees what else you might be doing, you can do that. And then you just click play again to resume. And then again, there's the annotation tool. So I'm using one right now. I've been using the spotlight, but anyone in your meeting can also annotate. So again, if you're using that whiteboard feature or if you're using um, you know, just anywhere a picture you want people to draw on, your participants, including all of you in this meeting right now, could draw on the screen. You can choose, do you want to use a line? Do you want to use, um, you know, boxes and shapes, you know, filled shapes, translucent shapes, open shapes, arrows, check marks. All of you guys can, can do these as well. See, someone's doing one right now. So each person can write on there. And, if, um, and it's a great way, again, to collaborate if you're working on a specific image. And then you could save that. Right. So whatever you work on, everyone collaborates. You're like, yep, this is exactly what we want it. I'm going to save it. And then I can share it out later with everybody. You can choose your colors. So each person can choose a different color so that it can distinguish, you know, who's, who's doing what, who's typing what. And then as a host, you also have the ability to clear your own drawing and clear everybody else's also. And again, saving it is a really big piece here. If you come up with something that you really liked, all work done together, you can save that. The next option is remote control. So basically giving someone keyboard and mouse, mouse control over your computer. Um, you know, use case of this is, you know, we're doing a really big PowerPoint here today. Maybe, you know, Lisa herself had about five or six slides that she owned and would have talked to. When we got to those, I could have given, I could give her keyboard and mouse control so she could click through at her pace instead of perhaps having to say, next slide, Marco, please. Next slide, Marco, please. Not a huge deal, but a slightly disjointed experience for everybody there. Under the dot, 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 more, this is where we see, you know, some of the other key action item, action buttons around chat, the breakout rooms, and the inviting, again, recording. You know, if annotation happens to become a problem, um, again, because all of your participants can do it, you can disable that attendee annotation so you don't have to worry about that as, as well. You could quickly end the meeting here if you wanted to also. Okay, so we're going to drop out of sharing again and move over to the next icon, which is chat. So this is the ability to chat with other people in the meeting that you are currently in. You click chat, it opens up a nice uh, new window for you and you can chat to everybody or you can chat to individuals privately. Um, you know, if you're gonna be doing both between chatting to the whole group and chatting privately, just be really mindful what message you're sending and who you're sending it to. Just wanna call that out. You can also send a file through chat if you wanted to. So again, if you maybe all worked on an annotation, together, you worked on some workflow, you saved that to your computer, you could then send it back out to everybody through the chat as its own file. And again, you can switch between chatting with everyone or chatting with given individuals. Record right here, nice little record button that you can pop up and, you know, again, you'll have record on this computer is the option. Once you're recording, you do see the little bubble and you have the ability to stop a recording or pause a recording. A uh, big difference here is if, you know, you've got a 15 minute meeting or, you know, call it a half hour meeting, you record for 10 minutes, you stop recording for 10, you record again for 10, you actually end up with two 10 minute recordings where if you'd used pause, you know, record 10, pause 10, record 10, you'd end up with one 20 minute recording. So it's just a small thing to call out between there. Again, those recordings will be stored to your local computer with a file that Zoom creates, and you can, of course, update that path, as we saw earlier in the settings of the client application. Okay, the last icon here, these little kind of four 
uh, the four tile here is the breakout rooms, right? So this is, again, pushing people out into different rooms so they can have their own conversations. So you're going to push them into their own meetings. When you click on breakout rooms, you get a window saying, hey, I notice you've got six people in this meeting. Uh, you know, how many rooms do you want to create? Um, two. Do you want it to happen automatically where Zoom just decides who goes where, or do you actually want to choose who you're pushing into each room? So if you choose manually, you do create breakout rooms. You've got breakout room one and two now. I could add more if I wanted to or even delete one. I can rename the room so it makes sense for the course that I'm in. I could delete the room if I needed to. Maybe I created one too many. But then when I'm ready, I click this assign and I just check the boxes next to the names of who I want to go into each room. So I check three here. I'm going to put these people all into one room. I click assign. I would do the same thing for the second one. And then I haven't opened the rooms yet. That's what this open all rooms is. But I'm just reviewing, do I have it configured the way I want to? I'm like, oop, you know what? I actually want to move Art. I didn't want him to be in breakout room one. I could move him. Better yet, I can exchange him if I need to, to keep the rooms even. Now I've got the rooms again configured great. They're all they're set how I want to. I would click this open all rooms. And then when I do that, each of the participants then gets a new, nice pop-up on their own screen that says the host has created this breakout, is asking you to move to breakout room one or two. Please click here. And it will take them into the breakout room. You as the host can tell if they've joined the breakout room or not by them being green. And if they haven't, you could ask them, hey, make sure you click the link, and then they would go into it. And you as the host have the ability to join the breakout room as well. So you would click this join. Do you want to click join breakout room one? Yes. Join that breakout room, and when you're ready, you can leave that breakout room. Now, as a host, you can't join multiple breakout rooms at the same time. You can only join one at a time, so just to call that out. But you can join that breakout room, check in, hey, how's everything going? Good, great, fine, leave, join breakout room two. You can also broadcast a message if you want to send a singular message out to both breakout rooms or multiple breakout rooms, depending on how many you have, you, know, you can send them a really important message, broadcast that out so they'll all get that message, scroll across their screens. You know, maybe it's a five minute time check or something like that. And just like we saw earlier before I set up the rooms, how I could have moved art, well, maybe I, the rooms are already created and after a certain while I want to move art to the other room. I could do that. And I could exchange him. So just the same. I could move Art to breakout room two or exchange him with someone else. When I'm ready to close down the rooms, right? So time's gone, you know, ready to close down the rooms. I've got the nice button. You know, the host just clicks this close all rooms. And what that does is it puts a minute timeline on it. So the people in each of those rooms will get again another pop up that says, host is closing these rooms. Would you like to leave now? So they could leave immediately. Or once the 60 seconds is done, that room will just shut down and it will bring them back into the main meeting. Now, maybe you did breakout rooms earlier in the session and you wanted to do it again at, you know, you did it at 15 minutes, you want to do it again at 45 minutes, you would actually click the breakout rooms button again. It would open up this window here first and you could open up all the rooms as they were, you know, so keeping them the same if you want the same people in the same rooms. Or you could recreate the rooms and say, you know what, I want to mix it up a bit now. Um, I want to sign them automatically or manually again and still mix it up. And you just follow that same process. And then the existing rooms would be replaced and people would be in the new rooms. Ending the meeting, pretty straightforward. Little end meeting on, on the right, you would just click on that. Meeting will shut down for you and all of your participants. All right, so we're going to actually move off the host controls now and we're going to talk about something different. We're going to look at the mobile app really fast. Um, so Zoom does have a mobile app for both Android and iOS devices. Um, you can get the app at the, at the Zoom download site, at the zoom.us forward slash download, or you can you know, very easily get it from the, uh, the stores for each of those. Once you download it, you know, it, it does just bring up the blank thing where you can log in if you need to or just join a meeting without logging in. We do suggest logging into the mobile app. It's a really cool tool. Um, you're going to do the same thing as before. Choose that SSO option that we talked about earlier. And then when you get logged in, you'll notice it looks very similar to the desktop application. You know, it shows all the chats that you've had going on if you're using the Zoom IM. You have the ability to join a meeting directly from your mobile app. So if someone gives you a meeting ID and 
you know, you're not in your office, you're on your phone, you're like, okay, great. Click in the ID, click join, it brings you right into that meeting over your, over your phone. Um, you can also schedule meetings directly from here um, or even host a meetings directly from here. So again, you're on your mobile app and you want to host a meeting. You come here first, you've got this nice big start a meeting button, it meeting launches. Again, it's got your picture from your profile, but you can turn that video on and people can see you and you can talk to them and you can turn on and off your audio. You can share content still and you can still manage your participants all right from the mobile app. The really powerful thing with the mobile app is this one right here this upcoming meetings. So when I go here, again, just like the desktop application, I can see all of those meetings that I'm the host of that I've scheduled, either recurring or date and time. So if I'm running late to a meeting, I'm walking in between buildings on campus and I need to make sure this meeting kicks off, um, I'm just gonna open up my phone, go into the Zoom mobile app, find the meeting that it's supposed to be and hit start. Then it starts with me as the host and anyone coming in, everybody comes in, the meeting's fine, it kicks off when it's supposed to. I continue to walk, I get to my desk, I sit down, I log into my desk, launch Zoom from my desk, join the meeting that way and shut down the mobile app. Um, so again, it's a great way to really join, start and make sure your own meetings kick off when you're not even sitting in front of your computer. You can also schedule meetings directly from the mobile app if you wanted to. So you would do schedule a meeting, and kind of walk through all those setups we saw before about topics, start time, duration, meeting passwords. Um, once you got it configured, you would hit done. It's the review page. You make sure you put it on the right calendar. You could invite people from your mobile app if you wanted to. Um, and then this is kind of the continuation of the re review page. So it puts the link to the meeting and the details below. So the Zoom mobile app, great, really powerful tool to be able to use, um, really nice experience. All right, coming up to a close here. Um, so for support for Zoom, there is an internal page for PSU support. Um, you can find that at the Get Support site. Don't have the link there, unfortunately. Um, I believe it's psuconferencing.edu, and then there's a Get Support there. Um, you can submit a ticket directly to your Penn State support team if you wanted to. It will also link to this Zoom support site. So you can do your internal support, or if you're wanting to learn a little more about Zoom or want to talk to Zoom support, you've got a number right there that you can call. Thank you, Glenna put it into the chat. It is conferencing.psu.edu um, is where you would find this, and then forward slash get dash support. Um, so you can contact your internal support or even Zoom support right from here. Now, if you log to the Zoom support site, here there's a lot of great information as well. You can click into any of these tiles to learn more about Zoom if you want. We've got a great, um, a lot of one minute video instructions on a few different items, um, just really quick snippets and introductions. You can also submit a ticket directly to Zoom. Um, you can also contact our support and you could also see more tutorials and training that our training team hosts multiple sessions per week, all manner of Zoom topic. They record the sessions they do, so you could view a previously one, or you could attend a live session if you wanted to. Okay. Um, so turning to the questions now, I do have another one in the chat. Greg asks, uh, which headset microphone com combination do you recommend to best conduct Zoom meetings? Um, you know, I don't know if we have like a pure recommendation because a lot of that's going to be internal, what you have available to you through the university. Um, they may create a recommendations page, um, but I just use a Plantronics headset um, and a Logitech uh, camera, you know, pretty simple ones that you can get. Um, but I know lots of people, you know, and I even host them as well when I'm on the road and I have my laptop, I'll just plug in my iPhone uh, headset and it runs still just fine. So a lot of that's just gonna be what you have available to you, but a good uh, USB camera is always recommended for like real high quality video. And then um, some sort of VoIP headset and, and all the services of, of it will work. Any other questions out there? Again, feel free to take yourself off of mute if you wanna ask the question live. Anything else someone was curious about or wants to see that maybe we covered earlier? Okay. 
If there's no more questions, we'll go ahead and end it here. Um, thank you so much for attending. Again, this is being recorded, so we will make that present. Um, oh, quick question. May I allow my students to conduct meetings with students in other sittings? Yeah, absolutely, Greg. Great question. So, um, again, with Zoom, if you have a Zoom license, um, which your students should because uh, Penn State purchased a site license, which means faculty, staff, students, um, you can invite anybody from anywhere to attend any meeting you would like. So if you want them to work on like a cross university project, maybe they're teaming up with people at a different university, um, they can absolutely use Zoom as a way to connect and collaborate on whatever that project may be. Great, great use case. Okay. So again, this recording will be made available. Oh. Still going. Can students start their own meetings? Uh, yes, Lisa, I believe they can. Once it, the full launch happens, students will have access to Zoom as well. Yep, Mike just put in it, and Zoom can have a pro account just like um, faculty and staff. They just sign into the site the same. They use their Penn State username and ID just like anybody else, and it will create a Zoom license for them, and they can absolutely host their sessions. Let's see if I ask again if there's any more questions because that's what every time I say we're going to shut down another question comes. So <laughs> um, if there's nothing else, then maybe we will really call it now. We are at time. Um, if you do have questions, again, go to that the internal support site for, for Penn State. You know, you can ask your questions there. You can reach out to your internal team if it's something that needs to come back to Zoom. Um, they absolutely know how to get a hold of me. Um, we have regular meetings that we check into each other. So um, we will hold more of these sessions in, in the future as well. So if you feel like attending a second session, please do so. Um, sometimes it's easier to know what you want to ask if you've had a chance to use Zoom a little bit. So if you kind of use it and want to come back for a second session, that's a great way to kind of dig in and ask some more questions. But, all right, thanks everybody. And we'll make this recording available to everybody once, uh, once it's finished uh, saving up to our cloud. And, Hope everyone has a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye-bye.